Today, the Strasbourg Railroad is one of the finest examples of turn-of-the-century steam railroading in the world. Nicknamed the Road to Paradise, millions of people have ridden Strasbourg's eight miles of track for more than a century and a half. The Strasbourg Railroad gives you, the rider, an opportunity to step back in time to when the world turned at a slower pace and steam was king. The Strasbourg Railroad is a rolling museum dedicated to capturing and preserving authentic steam railroading. Committed to restoring and preserving turn-of-the-century railroading, passengers can climb aboard the pristinely restored Strasbourg Railroad passenger cars, and their experience is the same as if they were riding in 1910. This is no easy task. It's back-breaking work, often using machines from the early 1900s. This wheel lathe, which is cutting into this wheel to make the right size, dates from 1913. The steam engines themselves have to be initially restored, then periodically torn apart and redone. Here is steam engine number 89, waiting to undergo heavy boiler repairs. And here is number 89 running on the tracks. The railroad restores equipment to museum standards and replicates in kind where possible. The difference between the Strasbourg Railroad and a museum is operation and hard day-to-day -day usage. Not only does Strasbourg equipment have to look right, it has to work right, too. There's a level of trust that we have. And, that, and that there's a level of trust we have when we go into a museum. There's a level of trust we have when we watch television. When you go to a tourist railroad, the level of trust is probably not as great as when you go to a museum. And I suppose it's just the little cantankerous bugger that lives inside me that says, I want to elevate that level of trust because we, we do it as well as many, many museums. We have to do some things differently because we operate this stuff. And, you know, we're, we're a consumer, not a preserver. The passenger cars on the trains require a huge effort to restore and make ready for use on the Strasbourg Railroad. Usually when we start we have a pile of rot and rust that uh, we must get rid of before we can rebuild the car. There's a perceived quality. Uh, people without actually knowing that they're riding in something special or accurate or what have you, they, they know it subconsciously and they come back. I mean, I think that probably our cars are nicer than an awful lot of people's houses. Uh, basically, we start from the floor and uh, remove all the sides, block the roof up, remove all the sides, any damaged wood, any rot, rebuild from the ground floor. As the shops restore cars, they often come upon surprising discoveries that add to the authenticity of the experience. We came across a lot of interesting uh, details on the ceilings. The stenciling, uh, we got a car in from one of the uh, yards when we, we were stripping the ceiling down and discovered this uh, stenciling on the ceiling and then we, we had another original car, the grasshopper level, so Craig went over and started uh, scaling, scaling down the ceiling on it. We discovered it had down beneath about 20 layers of paint. It had the same detailing and stenciling, so we, we redid the car and recopied the original stenciling. If we have original uh, woodwork in the car, that can be stripped and refurbished, we do that. Otherwise, we reproduce what, what the uh, Boston and Maine cars were originally designed to look like. It's a painstaking process, but it results in beautiful museum-quality cars like this one. A museum on wheels, the Strasbourg Railroad is also an extremely successful destination for travelers and tourists. In 1999, more than 350,000 people rode the Strasbourg Rails. But it didn't start out with this as its goal. The railroad evolved from its passenger and freight carrying start to a mostly freight operation with a Humpshire mill, to near abandonment, then to a hobby, and finally to the bustling railroad it is today. The Strasbourg Railroad began, like most other railroads in the country, as a connection between two points. Before the railroads began crisscrossing the country, Strasburg, Pennsylvania was a bustling town, a key stop along the Conestoga wagon route. As railroads gained in popularity, wagon routes became obsolete. 
Strasburg lost income and traffic and was bypassed by the new Philadelphia and Columbia Railroad, which missed Strasburg by several miles. Shown here is the Lehman Place station of the Philadelphia and Columbia Railroad, now the end of the Strasburg line. The town of Strasburg petitioned the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania in 1832 to build their own short line. The charter was issued on June 9, 1832, and the Strasburg Railroad was born. That date is important because it makes Strasburg the oldest continuously operating railroad in all of North America. In the beginning, the Strasburg Railroad was a horse-drawn operation until the first steam locomotive, the William Penn, built in 1836 and thought to be one of the first 50 steam locomotives built in the U.S., was purchased in 1851. The railroad hauled freight, mail, and passengers from Strasburg to the main line, where they could catch connections to the bigger cities of Lancaster, Philadelphia, and other points. A steam mill was built in Strasburg in 1866, and the railroad brought in the coal its operation needed. The railroad changed hands several times, but the freight and passenger business continued strong. The cost to go from Strasburg to Lehman's Place in the early years was 25 cents one way, 40 cents round trip. When the streetcar run by the Conestoga Traction Company finally reached Strasburg in 1901 and a direct connection to Lancaster, Pennsylvania was made, the line suffered serious setbacks. In 1918, when State Senator John Humsher purchased the mill and the railroad, automobiles were becoming popular, the need for passenger rail service declined, and the railroad became primarily a freight line. In 1926, the Humsher mill decided steam was too expensive and purchased the Plymouth gas locomotive. From 1926 to 1957, the railroad continued to operate, lugging freight from the mill to Layman's Place and back. By 1957, however, the railroad was in horrible shape, and the first steps toward official abandonment were being taken. The nation's oldest railroad was put up for sale. Ads appeared in the local newspapers, and buyers were sought. There wasn't much to buy, however. The track was unbelievable. You couldn't even see it through the brush and so forth. The brush was at least three feet deep, and uh, it was in very, very bad condition and hadn't been repaired more than just enough to keep the train on the track by going very slow. Henry Long, a longtime model railroader with a huge love for trains, saw the ads in the newspaper and started thinking about getting some friends together to buy the railroad. Getting enough investors was a challenge for Henry Long and his friends. The $450 per share price scared off more than a few would-be investors, and the deteriorating condition of the railroad was an even greater deterrent. In fact, after uh, Harold Affin had bought stock, time and looked at the railroad, he says, where is it? <laughs> Couldn't even see it, it was in, all in weeds. <laughs> Finally, Mr. Long and his investors came up with an idea that would guarantee enough interest in buying the railroad. So I wrote another letter to Henry Long in which I suggested that if we were to go around to various individuals and offer them a vice presidency with each share of stock that they bought, that we might be able to interest some of these railroad fans in buying it. The big trick for the other people, other than the ones of us that had it that wanted a hobby, was that you would be a vice president of a Pennsylvania Railroad. This is a still from one of the first rides, which most of the VPs rode. Even though they had that many executives, there wasn't much real-world railroading experience among them. They, along with the other VPs, spent the months before and after the purchase readying the railroad for operation, cleaning and repairing the rolling stock, cutting weeds, fixing track and everything else that needed to be done. They didn't hire out any of the work. They did it themselves, learning as they went along. Those early days weren't all wine and roses, however. The condition of the track, the bed, and the rolling stock met a continuing series of challenges. They were all met with good humor, common sense, and elbow grease. The operation was much more casual at the very beginning. The owners and their guests rode the train whenever they wanted, or whenever they could afford it. However, word was getting out about the railroad, and more people were coming to Strasburg to ride. The railroad was running on weekends at first, but soon that was not enough. Tourism was starting to take off, 
so the timing of the railroad was fantastic. The railroad began to acquire more coaches, and in their first full year of operation, 1959, the Strasburg Railroad served over 8,000 passengers. And then we began to get to the point where the Plymouth locomotive was pretty severely taxed to pull all these cars up the hill, look at the ground along and low like a bulldozer. And uh, it was obvious that we needed more equipment and so forth. We were operating out of the mill property. We found this old Victorian station at East Petersburg and we needed a station here at East Strasburg, so we cut the building into nine separate pieces, roof sections and, and building sections, braced it, loaded it on low boys, brought it down here by highway, and reassembled it where it sits today, and we use it presently. All of this was important, but it was the addition of steam in 1960 that really put the railroad on the map. People come to the Strasburg Railroad for the countryside, for the link to the Amish, as an exciting day trip while touring Lancaster County. But most of all, the people come for the steam. When we had the steam engine, the, the, the first steam engine, 31, it, it was very much a nostalgic thing. And 31 was the first locomotive brought back into FRA service in this country. But a steam locomotive is a very it's an interesting machine because they are cantankerous. They, they have personalities of their own and they, they can be very pleasant to be around and they can be uh, very unpleasant to be around. Um, and, and, and they're not alive, but, but when you interact with it, with the locomotive, it, it does become alive. And you're not interacting in the form of pushing buttons and, and digital readouts. It's, it's very much uh, you become a part of the machine. And I, but I, I'll use some figures. I think the first year it was 6,000, and then it went to 12,000, and then it would jump up to 50,000. I mean, they're just big, of course we were running more trains too, but it, uh, of course, it got up to 400,000. It's, uh, it's all out there to see. Um, a diesel locomotive or electric, it's all contained in a neat little package, but steam locomotive, you see the rods thrashing around, you see the smoke, you see the steam. Uh, it sounds much different than anything else. It's all out there for everybody to see. It was a big hit because it was uh, advertised in the newspapers that we were going to run steam on Labor Day weekend. So Labor Day weekend was a big weekend anyhow, and it turned out to be very good weather. So we had a a very good turnout. Everything with wheels on it, we had it rolling in that weekend. We quickly found out that the track was in very bad shape and needed repair work. And uh, what was good enough for the Plymouth gasoline locomotive, it was nowhere near enough for 100 tons of steam locomotive. And consequently, we had broken rails all over the place there, and we had cancel trains and repair the rails and put in the additional ties here and there and get going. First run with the steam engine, okay, that was 31 uh, Labor Day of 1960. And we figured, you know, we had all the beautiful tracking and everything, weeds, weeds all over every place. As we'd go down, I have to first say that the Pennsylvania was on maintenance men were on strike and they had homes for them at Lemon Place, the other end of our line. And as we'd go down, you'd hear snap, you know, snap. We didn't know what deal it was until we found out we were breaking the rails. So they would fix the track as when we went down, they'd fix it so that we could come back. And then what we broke coming back, we would go down, it would be fixed. That's when we found out we had to fix a track. Up to that time, the little Plymouth went very fine. 75 ton on three axles, that's 25 uh, ton an axle, and we never had anything like that before. I mean, freight cars in those days were a 40 ton car was a big car. Mm -hmm. Steam locomotive to bed at night, and you bank off the fire, there's no noise. 
and that locomotive is really ready to go. All you have to do is get on it and pull the throttle and away you go. Of course, you can't get stopped because you don't have any brakes because the air compressor is off. But it's kind of like they're sleeping, just like a person. And if you go into an engine house at night where there's a number of steam locomotives that are bedded down, you will hear them sleeping. Some of them snore, some of them don't. Uh, but they'll make funny little noises. And you really get a sense in the quiet of a roundhouse or an engine house, you really get a sense of the soul, for lack of a better term, of a steam locomotive. It's got all this stuff, you know, I mean, it's like it comes rolling in there and there's stuff flailing around, there's oil flying off and the safety valve goes and there's smoke coming out and, you know, it stinks and it, I think it smells good, but, you know, I mean, it's, there's, there's really a lot of, I mean, there's a lot of sensory uh, stimulation there when this thing comes in. I mean, it's just like, wow, what is that? And it's like you can see into the soul of it. You, and a little kid looking at it or anybody else is used to this box that you push a button and, you know, the theory of relativity comes out and then makes you breakfast. And you know, oh, that's cool. I mean, you look at this and you see this is how it works, you know? I mean, look at this pushing back and forth and the wheels are flying around, you know, and there's the smoke and there's the heat and there's the water and it's wow, you know, so I think that that's the appeal today. Well, I maintain they all have personalities and so, which is, oh, many people would think that's a little warped and, and but that's okay because to work on these things I think you have to be a little warped and you have to be a little wacky, um, but, but they do. Um, we, we had a locomotive 1223 that was a bit of a prima donna. And the locomotives are all she's, for whatever reason. I'm not going to touch that. I'm not going to get into that. But at any rate, they're all referred to as she. At any rate, she had this, she's a great engine, and I miss her terribly. Um, but it seemed like if you paid too much attention to the other engines over the winter, she'd just break. Yeah, she'd be out there for no reason at all. She'd just like drop something on the ground. And you'd say, oh, wonderful. So you'd go and fix her. Whereas 31, which everybody complains about 31, is just you know, as ugly as 060, which was our first engine. You know, it bounces around, it throws you around. It's like, oh, you know, do I have to run this thing today? And the engine crews hate it. And, but 31, no matter how much you abused her, verbally or otherwise, she just went out there and she'd just chug up and down the track and do her job. And so she was kind of a 90s. 90s a little bit like that. She, she gets the job done. Well, 90s a Baldwin decapod that ran for the Great Western Railroad in Colorado. And there's a, there's a motion and a, there's a life to a steam engine that you don't get from a diesel or an electric. It's a, it's a fascinating uh, mechanical accomplishment. <laughs> The addition of steam changed the railroad and changed the people who were operating it and the people who came to visit the railroad. There's nothing like steam. One of the things that has hurt our industry is so many of the old railroaders remember how they did things on steam locomotives in the last days of steam. And that was entirely different than how they did things when they meant to keep steam locomotives running. In the last days of steam, the object of the exercise was get the thing out of the engine house and down the road. If it broke more than halfway to the next terminal, that was great because they'd have to fix it and we wouldn't have to see it again. The odds are it was going to get scrapped soon anyway. And a lot of the information that we have operated on in our industry has been this type of information and it has been very detrimental to our industry. Was the success of the Strasburg Railroad part of some grand plan of the original owners? No, no, nobody ever had any idea it would be like what it is today. No idea at all. If you'd have said that, why, well, I think you'd have scared everybody away. <laughs> I, I, I think my thinking was uh, a matter of moving my railroad operations out of the basement out onto the uh, the, the real thing and uh, 
my thinking was to operate the railroad, continue to haul a little bit of freight, and uh, uh, if anyone was around who wanted to uh, go for a ride, take them along. Uh, playing at uh, model railroading out outdoors was uh, my thinking of it. Nothing like it is at the present time, or nothing like it did become. There yeah, we. Uh... We thought if we have one locomotive, a big locomotive, and, and three or four passenger cars, it'd be all we'd ever need. We never foresaw the need for additional passenger cars over and above the capacity to handle them. And people came faster than we had equipment coming in to handle them. And we got passenger cars from all over the eastern part of the country and locomotives and so forth, and the shops have done a tremendous job in rebuilding the equipment. And we have our, we've developed our own machine shops and car repair shops and things of that sort that we never thought we would ever have at the very beginning. When I was a kid, I believe I was seven years old, uh, my dad was, uh, Bill Modinger was one of the original purchasers. He and my mom each bought a share of stock in the railroad. Um, and so I used to hang around here a lot. Um, I, would, I would always, whenever the opportunity arose to come down to the railroad, I would be tagging along. And in fact, we lived in Lancaster and, and my dad used to sometimes pick Huber Leith up and, and uh, so we'd all go down in the, in the car together or sometimes Huber would drive and we'd all come down together. But it really was a neat, neat place to be as a kid and, and we would ride the train constantly um, and all the guys that, 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 that worked here, that owned the railroad, were pretty tolerant of us and, uh, and they would teach us things and, and we, didn't, we didn't get in their hair too terribly much. But it was a very, very different place then than it is now. Um, and, I, and in some ways I'm sorry about that because today it, if it was like it was then, both my kids would be a lot more interested in it because it just was really get down and dirty fun. Uh, now it, it's a pretty slick operation, but it has to be because there's so many people come here. In those days, the only people that came to ride it were the guys that owned it. I mean, I can remember standing around watching these guys pass the hat to buy gas to put into Plymouth to go down and get a freight car. Um, I mean, that, that's, that's how primitive it was. I mean, our trains, were, our trains were made up of track cars and little flat cars with bus seats on them. Visiting the Strasburg Railroad is like stepping back in time, like being an actor in your very own movie, riding the rails in authentic turn-of-the-century cars pulled by an honest-to-goodness steam locomotive. The Strasburg Railroad has been involved in a number of movie productions, from Hello, Dolly! to The Wild Wild West and Thomas and the Magic Railroad. Many people don't know the fact that we provided the train for the movie Hello, Dolly. Now, this was back in the late 60s when the movie was filmed. And we took one of our locomotives, the fact is it was a 1223, and painted it to the specifications for the movie people. And we provided the coaches and we also built the car that is in use today as the Hello, Dolly car. It was a railroad coach that was stripped down and rebuilt to the movie specifications. And we built it right here in these buildings. And uh, it was quite a, a project that we worked on for a number of months, but uh, I helped to build that equipment. One of the draws of the railroad is it affords the best opportunity to ride through some of the most beautiful farm country anywhere and see 14 Amish farms along the route. Normally, the Amish will avoid tourists where possible. The train is different, however. The Amish wave at the train and ride the train quite often. Lancaster County probably has more Amish farms than it did in 1975. Um, and the railroad affords people one of the best views they're going to have of, of Amish farms or of, of Lancaster County farmland because without intruding, like in automobiles, the intrusion where you go putt-putting around in the back roads and get lost and what have you, 
you can come and, 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 and ride the train and just look out and see the Amish farmland. So I think that that, is, that has a great deal of appeal. The railroad's relationship with the Amish has always been good. The route itself is lined with Amish farms, and the Amish that live in the area use the railroad for their transportation needs. In the early days, Amish boys would come offering buggy rides to Strasburg's passengers. Sometimes relations with the neighbors take an interesting twist. Until 1987, Strasburg trains stopped at Carpenter's Crossing, and the firemen flagged the train across. One Amish farmer, for one reason or another, greased the rails at the crossing. This was not necessarily a good idea, because when the rails were greased, the train would go sliding across the road. One of the founders, Bill Modinger, hid in the cemetery to find out who was doing it and filmed the Amishmen greasing the rails. The Amish are good neighbors, and their lifestyle, which has not changed significantly since the 1700s, helps recreate the atmosphere for which the Strasburg Railroad is aiming. The Strasburg Railroad is part of both communities, easily integrating with the Amish and the English, which is what the Amish call outsiders. The future is bright for the Strasburg Railroad. With each passing year, the railroad works toward enhancing the visitor's experience and making the experience closer to what train travel was like in the beginning of the 20th century. I think that I would like to see the railroad be a place that a person could come to, walk through the front door, and be in 1915 whatever is involved in that, that, that that's what would happen. The sights, the sounds, the smells, everything. Past, present, and future, it all comes together at the Strasburg Railroad. Though the ride is only an eight mile round trip, it's a 100 year journey into our collective pasts, presents, and possible futures. <laughs>